Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today we are finally going to be taking a look at M. Graham's gouache. It has been a while since I have played around with gouache in general, which is part of the reason why this video has been such a long time coming. I have made a couple of videos on the channel over the years to cover the Mission Hybrid gouache and the Schmincke Hordam gouache, and I've also tried the Holbein and Pass brands off camera, but it's probably pretty obvious that this is not my main medium. So just to set up the premise of this video, for those of you who are new here, you are going to be watching a watercolor artist who doesn't really dabble in many other mediums take a look at this five color gouache set. I actually received this little set of gouache years ago, and I want to apologize for whoever sent them to me if you are still out there watching. I believe it was either Imgram themselves or a distributor who sent me a couple of different things at once with no time constraints or requests for a video. However, two moves and a couple years later, I have lost my records of where these came from. Regardless, I want to thank you for sending these so that we can all take a look at them today. M. Graham is a smaller paint company located in Oregon in the United States. Their watercolors are known for being honey-based and packed with pigment, and their gouache follows suit. While many brands of gouache are made with the addition of fillers or chalk to create a more opaque product, M. Graham makes it clear on their packaging that their gouache is a light fast product that is intended for fine art uses. They do not include any additional, as they call them, adulterants, which means that they will be a variety of opacities based on the pigments that are used in each individual tube. None of the colors are mixed with white, as they want to leave that up to the individual artist. Given how clean they keep their colors, there are only 35 in the line, and all but six of them are single pigment formulas. This little set today includes Azo Yellow PY151, Naphthol Red PR112, Cobalt Blue PB28, Titanium White PW6, and Ivory Black PBK9. At the time of recording this video, this set is currently available on Amazon and Blick. It's not available over on Jackson's, at least I couldn't find it there. And it retails between $33 and $40, coming out to either $6.60 per tube or $8 per 15 milliliter tube. I'm sure that many of my regular viewers can guess that several of these colors are not colors that I would have picked for myself, but I did end up being pleasantly surprised, so let's go ahead and take a closer look. In my Let's Learn Gouache video, I mentioned that I had tried to use palettes of dried gouache, like you would with a standard watercolor palette, meaning that you let the paints dry in the wells and reconstitute them as you go. However, I finally gave in to using fresh paint in that video because I was just getting really frustrated at how much the other brands were cracking and falling out of their wells. It wasn't enjoyable for me to work with it that way. I had a ton of fun working with the fresh paint. However, I have gotten numerous questions about M. Graham's gouache specifically and how it re-wets from a palette, so I figured this was a good time to give a poured gouache palette another shot. M. Graham contains honey as a natural humectant, which in theory means that it should draw more moisture from the air, keeping them at a more workable consistency. This is certainly true for my M. Graham watercolor palette that I cannot store on its side here in central Texas, otherwise my colors will literally run out of their wells. I decided to use a Magello airtight palette for the gently sloping wells that it has and I really enjoy working with, but I do want to make it clear that it was never my intent to keep the paint moist inside the palette as this can lead to mold if you are using tap water like I do. Instead, I poured the paint and then intentionally left the palette open to sit for a couple of weeks before coming back to it. That way we can test how well it reconstitutes and it will be easier to store without molding. Each of the primary colors in the set got their own wells, of course, and I also decided to mix up secondary colors as well, meaning that I added an orange, a green, and a purple. While I could have purchased additional convenience colors, I wanted to see what this little five color set was capable of since it's their starter option. So after the primaries and the secondary colors were in, I also mixed up a few earth tones as well. 
The first earth tone was actually the hardest. I was aiming for a yellow ochre or raw sienna adjacent color, which I did not achieve. However, I did get to a light brown, so I just called it good enough. It was mixed using mostly white and yellow with some red and just a touch of blue to neutralize it out a bit. The second earth tone set out to be a burnt sienna hue, which I was able to achieve reasonably quickly. I started off with yellow and mixed in purple and then topped it off with a little bit more red to warm everything up. The final earth tone was by far the easiest. I was able to mix up all three primary colors in roughly equal proportions and ended up somewhere between a raw and burnt umber. Finally, I wanted to mix up a couple of convenience grays and add the black and white to the palette. While the paint was still wet, I swatched out the color palette and played around with some washes. Because with a warm red in the palette, I expected to get a nearly black color when I mixed it with blue. However, we ended up with a pretty decent purple that I was really happy with. I was also surprised to see so much granulation in the washes. That cobalt blue has certainly made itself known in every mixture it has touched. I especially love it in the green and dark brown mixtures when you get some of the blue granulation showing through. In addition to the initial swatches, I also worked on a couple of sketches to get a feel for the brand before I started to actually record a video for you all. I started off with a familiar subject first, a rhino that I have painted many times before. I also did a quick sketch of a giraffe, though honestly that painting is subpar and the background wash is the star of that piece. Then I let the paints completely dry and came back to them a couple of weeks later. The paints did dry out a bit more than I had expected, though none of them were loose enough to fall out of their wells. Though I do want to let you know that this was kept flat in the studio and I'm not sure how well it would have fared if I had carried it around with me or stored it on its side. I wanted to show you how the paints re-wet in real time using a synthetic round brush. This one is from Jackson's. So I'm including some footage of one of the single pigments, the yellow, as well as one of the mixed colors, that light brown. They weren't too difficult to work up into usable paint again, but to save some time, I would recommend letting the color sit with a bit of water to reconstitute before you begin working. Once the palette was reconstituted with water, I recorded a second swatching of the palette so that you guys could all see and so that we could compare it to the previous set of swatches that I did with the fresh paint. This isn't going to be a perfect comparison because unfortunately I didn't have any more of the Hanamule journal paper. This second set of swatches is done on Blick Premier hot pressed paper, which is made of cotton and is more absorbent, so you will see smoother gradients with fewer backgrounds. That isn't the quality of the paint between wet and dry, that's the papers. What we will be looking for is vibrancy and how well they handle.
Pigment wise, I feel like these are almost as saturated as the fresh samples. You will need to use a bit more effort to work up a solid mass tone, or if you prefer to work in thick layers. But if you are working in glazes, the difference will be pretty minimal. Where you will see the biggest difference is in the white. I was not able to get quite the same opacity from the dried palette. So if you are looking to place large blocks of white or any color really, um, especially the highlights at the end of the painting, I would recommend grabbing the paint fresh from the tube. It will just save you a lot of time and effort. We can swatch all day long, but to get a good feel for any new brand of paint, we just need to dive in and do some paintings. Today, that painting is going to be of an African wild dog, a species that I have painted before in watercolors, so I was curious to see how the two processes or experiences would compare. Since the Let's Learn Gouache video, I have watched a lot more content on painting with gouache. I did my best to take in a variety of techniques and I'll put some links to the videos I watched in the description below if you wanna learn more about painting with gouache in general, rather than a review on this particular brand of paint. One of the biggest objections that I got in the comments of my last video is that I was using the paints too thickly and I have a couple of comments on that. As you can see here, we are starting off with a very thin wash as an underpainting. Watching many more videos on the subject, it seems like this is the more proper way of painting with this medium, is to start with these thin washes and build up thicker layers as you continue through the painting. The reasoning here is that gouache is reactivatable. Thinner glazes will sink into the paper a bit better, while thicker layers will sit on top of the paper. So if you start the painting with thick layers, you are almost guaranteed to move around or lift that paint back up when you go over it again. For this painting, I tried to implement as much of this practice as possible. The yellow underpainting was followed by a thin to moderate layer of browns in order to block in a value map that I could use. And from there, I had to completely switch my watercolor gears again and attempt to paint from dark to light rather than from light to dark like we normally do in watercolors. If you have seen my previous video or any number of other gouache videos out there, you might already know why that is. Our lighter mixtures are going to contain white, and if we try to layer dark colors on top of white paint, there is a high likelihood that we will end up muddying or muting the colors. This is not a hard rule, but one that I try to stick to as much as possible to keep the colors cleaner. It's easier to put the lighter colors over the dark ones, it just, it just works out better that way. We're going to come back to that thick versus thin painting in a few moments, but I did want to let you know about these paints in particular, since that is the review today. These paints did exactly what I expected them to do. There were no surprises, no unexpected color mixes. The colors that I expected to be opaque were, and I was able to layer without issue. This is an excellent quality product and one that I would not hesitate to recommend if you are looking for a high quality and affordable gouache in the United States. That being said, and to no fault of the paints themselves, I didn't have fun painting this painting like I hoped I would. I was so focused on trying to paint it correctly and make sure that I wasn't using too much gouache too early uh, that it just didn't feel good. I know that some of this is attributed to my lack of practice with these techniques, not the supplies. They feel really awkward and uncomfortable, and the only way for me to address that personally is to work with them more often. No one becomes fluent in a new medium with a couple of paintings. And using this thin to thick approach, this painting is objectively better than the rhinos from my past video that were, in other people's opinion, painted too thickly, but the entire time that I was painting this one, I just wanted to slap down some thick paint and have fun with it with some big broad brush strokes, and that's how I wanted to paint with the gouache. Since I use gouache for fun rather than for work at this point in my career, whether it's technically good or not doesn't really matter to me. And I'd probably like to play around more with this idea and see if I can really hone in on the techniques that I like to use and then go from there, I guess. I know that this is an Imgram review, but I do want to mention a little something extra about that Schmincke Hordam gouache from the previous video. 
People were so worried that my paint was going to crack because of how thickly I laid it on the paper. And while I have experienced that with other brands like Holbein, that painting that I did is still intact and it hasn't changed at all since the day I painted it. I've kind of, I mean, not bent in half, but I've moved the paper back and forth. I've put stress on it and it's totally awesome. So while Schmincke may be a really expensive option for paint, it's really, really good. And I really love using it and would not hesitate to recommend it if it's something that is affordable in your area. Since I didn't paint that thickly with the Imgrams in this video, I'll have to do some more tests to see if they're equatable, like if the two are the same or not. But what I did end up with from this experience is a painting made with a reliable, high quality, light fast gouache. I was really pleasantly surprised at how easy it was to mix up new colors in the well. So if you're a professional artist who sells your work or a non-professional who doesn't want your work to fade and you're debating between one of those really large craft sets or just a few tubes of a higher quality brand like M. Graham, I would recommend the M. Graham. Plus it's way more eco-friendly without all that extra plastic packaging and you can replace the colors as they run out instead of having to buy a whole new set again. I will try to continue playing around with gouache off camera, perhaps mixing up some fun pastel shades and see if I can find some techniques that feel right to me because that's my missing piece at the moment. Between these M. Graham paints and the Schmincke ones that I already had, I don't feel like I need to look elsewhere for supplies. It's really just about the time that I need to sink into this medium. You can find this gouache set along with the brushes and paper that I used in this video in the description below. This painting will be available in the shop update from May 10th to May 16th, 2021, and all orders placed during this time will ship on May 17th and 18th. Before you go, I do want to give you a little bit of a channel update. I am currently dealing with some additional health issues, more than usual, and I may have to step away from content creation for a little while during the next couple of months. However, I am working my tail off trying to produce enough content to release a new video every two to three weeks while I'm stepping away, and hopefully you won't notice too much of that absence, especially since this past year it's been inconsistent anyway. The videos that I am trying to pump out won't be as technically involved as my usual content due to the amount of work that they require. Things like the color spotlight and brand by brand are going to be on a temporary pause, but I will get all of those back out uh, when I come back. There is a longer explanation of what's going on over on Patreon if you are interested. And as always, I want to thank my patrons for their amazing support so that I am able to keep doing what I'm doing even when life and medical issues get in the way. If you enjoyed this video, I'd really appreciate it if you can give it a like. And if you'd like to see more watercolor content, make sure you're subscribed and turn on that bell for notifications. Comments are a great help for those YouTube algorithms, so thank you in advance for each and every one that you leave. I do read every comment that is posted in the few days following an upload and reply to as many as I can, so hopefully I will see you down there. Until next time, my friends, happy painting.